Good morning. I'd like to pray before we start. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time that we can, we can gather together in your name and worship you, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would speak through me and that you would speak to all of us this morning, including myself, Lord. I'm preaching this message to myself before I'm preaching it to anyone else. So I ask, Lord, that you would give myself and all of us ears to hear what the Spirit is communicating to the church in this hour. Holy Spirit, I ask that your presence would come down in this place and that you would reveal more of Christ Jesus to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could all please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. And it reads, There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to tear down, and a time to build. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. There's a time for everything. We see here each of these examples given, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to mourn, a time to dance. In each one of these, there is a positive and there's a negative. There are contrasting times, but in all of this, there is complete continuity. Life is a cycle. I'm reading the NIV version. It says, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. If you read the Good News Bible version, it says, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. And in the NIV here, it says that there is a time to be born and a time to die. And the Good News translation says, God sets the time for birth and the time for death. We don't get to choose the times. God has already appointed them. Our job is to determine how we are going to respond to those times. We're to use the times to figure out what this life is all about. James 4, 13 through 15 reads, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. In Ecclesiastes here, Solomon is the author of the book, and he's writing to get us to live in such a way that our lives have meaning. 
A lot of Ecclesiastes, he writes, everything is meaningless. There's nothing new under the sun. He's writing in such a way to give our lives meaning. How do we respond to the times then? Do we respond in an earthly manner or in, an he- or in a heavenly manner? Do we respond to the times in a way that glorifies God so that he can trust us and use us and so that we can also trust in him and allow him to use us? The title of this message is Sometimes It Be That Way, which is a phrase that me and my friends use to each other instead of, it's mostly used in a negative way, be like, instead of like, oh, that stinks or that's too bad. It's like, yeah, sometimes it be that way. And to use this phrase throughout this message, I'm going to speak on three situations given in Scripture that describe people who are stuck in a rut. Genesis chapter 11, verses 26 through 32 says, After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out in Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. I'm going to speak a little bit here on the rut of Terah. It says here that his youngest son, Haran, died. And I'm not a parent, but I can imagine that is the absolute worst thing for a parent to go through is to have one of your children die. So his youngest son, Haran, died. So they set out for Canaan. They left Ur of the Chaldeans, set out for Canaan. And it says that Terah took Abram, Lot, Sarai. I find it quite interesting that Nahor and Milcah and Iscah all stayed behind in Ur of the Chaldeans. I don't know why. Maybe they had business to attend to. Maybe they had whatever reasons. I I can't figure it out. But I just thought it was interesting that they stayed behind. If you could please put that picture up, Joel, of the map. Thank you. So in the bottom right corner, we see that the location of Ur of the Chaldeans. And on the left side, we see the land of Canaan, which was their destination, which would eventually become known as the promised land. And instead of just taking a straight shot west from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan, they decided to go north and stay along the Euphrates River and ended up in the city of Haran, which, funny enough, has the same name as Terah's youngest son. So they stopped in Haran. Instead of continuing down to the land of Canaan, they stopped in Haran. 
And some scholars believe that the name Haran means crossroads. So they came to this crossroads and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do now? Should we just stay here? Should we continue on? It said that altogether Terah lived 205 years and ended up dying in the city of Haran. So I don't know if Terah was too old to continue the journey or if he became sick or if the city of Haran just made him think so much of his son Haran that he did not want to continue at all. Which could have caused him to lose hope in reaching his destination. Too many people get so close to the promised land that they stop and settle in the world around them. God has called us to be pioneers, not settlers. A pioneer blazes the trail. A settler is someone who follows the pioneer and settles on the land that the pioneer has already discovered. Terah stopped and settled in Haran. Sometimes it be that way. If we read on in the next chapter of Genesis, we see that God calls Abram to continue and finish the journey. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he had set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram didn't just settle in Haran. He obeyed God and continued the journey. The second example for someone stuck in a rut that I want to share this morning is blind Bartimaeus. If we read in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, it says that they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So here we have a blind man Begging on the road, his name is Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. I'm not sure if Bartimaeus was his actual name or if he just went by son of Timaeus. Like, who's that? Oh, that's just Timaeus' kid. We don't care about him. We don't need to know his name. His father's cool, but whatever. Who cares about him? But he was sitting by the roadside begging. He was stuck, and he couldn't physically see a way out of his situation. Some people are stuck, and they can't see a way out spiritually. You want to put that picture up, Joel? Here we see a guy stranded on the side of the road with all these cars passing by him. We see that he's got a pretty helpless situation on hand and all these cars 
are right there driving by him, and we can see that not a single one is willing to pull over, help him out. And he's just leaning up against his car, waiting for someone to come help him. He was stuck while other people were passing him by, continuing on with their lives. People who are stuck live in the past while life passes them by. He was stuck, blind and begging. He was going up to people. People would come up to him. He would hear them and he would be like, help, help, help. Just a little bit. Just give me some crumbs. Give me some scraps. Give me the change off of your blessings. Help. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. Help. I want to make it very clear I'm not talking about prosperity gospel when I say give me the change off of your blessings. I rebuke the prosperity gospel ever being preached from this pulpit in Jesus' name. The prosperity gospel says Jesus wants you to have a house. He wants you to have the fastest car. He wants you to have all these riches. And meanwhile, in the gospels, Jesus says the Son of Man does not have a place to rest his head. Help. You see, some people go to church just to get inspiration. Some people might go to church to get challenged. God wants us to attend church to get changed. Some people sit through service without participating, without worshiping. They can get close to the power of God, but they don't actually enter into the power of God because they're stuck. They have the mindset of a beggar. So what is the mindset of a beggar? Beggars are never satisfied. You can never give them enough. You can never love them enough. People don't understand them enough. Their priorities are often out of order. Just yesterday, I was on my way to work and I pulled off of the highway and right there at the stoplight, there was a homeless man and he had a sign, he had a smile on his face asking for people to give him some handouts. The sign read, and I kid you not, the sign read, allergic to water, need money for vodka. His priorities were out of order. When we contribute to the beggar's cup, We strengthen their position to beg even more and get more comfortable in the rut that they are stuck in. Now, I'm not saying if you see someone on the side of the road, I'm not saying don't give them any money or don't try to help them in some way. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm speaking more on a spiritual level than a physical level. But we need to help people get out of their ruts instead of contributing to their ruts. Bartimaeus couldn't see the people, but he could hear them. And he heard that Jesus was there. Sometimes God lets us hear about him and hear about the works that he's done, who he is, 
before letting us experience them ourselves. Bartimaeus was blind. He was sitting on the side of the road begging. Help. Help. And he heard Jesus was there, so he went from help, help, to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He went from begging to shouting because he heard that Jesus was there. He wanted to escape his rut and turn to Jesus when, meanwhile, there were people that rebuked him and said, shut up, Bartimaeus. Sometimes it be that way. The people had Bartimaeus' priorities out of order, but Bartimaeus had his priorities in order. God forbid if we rebuke someone or hinder someone from getting to Christ. His faith in Christ healed him, and he got up, was able to see, and he followed Jesus along the rest of the road. He got out of his rut. The third example is the lame beggar, found in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him and said, as did John. Then Peter, or sorry, I lost my Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do I give you, have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Here in this passage, it just says that he's a lame beggar. There's no name given. We don't know who this guy's, what this guy's name was. We have no idea who this person was. All we know is that he was a lame beggar, and he had to be carried and placed at the gate called Beautiful every day to beg from people who were entering into the temple courts. Which, I have to ask the question, did the people who carried them who carried him there and placed him there, did they ever contribute to his cup? Did they ever help him out in any other way? Or did they just put him there and move on? I believe that the beggar was probably at least thankful that they carried him and placed him there. I said it earlier again, let us not contribute to each other's cups. Let us not contribute to each other's ruts, but let us edify each other, build each other up in the faith. Peter and John did not contribute to his cup. They healed him in Jesus' name. Which leads me to ask, how would we respond to this beggar? 
would we see his condition? He's just sitting here. Help. Unlike Bartimaeus, this guy could actually see the people walking by him. He just couldn't walk. But he's still sitting there saying, help. How would we respond to this guy? Would we give him some money? Would we just look at him, see his condition, say, oh, sometimes it'd be that way, and walk into the temple courts, ignore him? Would we not even look at him once? Would we, if you're walking in with your kids, would you try to hide their eyes from this guy? Would any of us have enough faith to do what Peter did and say, silver or gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you? In Jesus' name, get up and walk and that we would have enough faith for it to actually happen? I'm preaching to myself before I'm preaching to any of you. I'm asking myself these questions. I can tell you from personal experience, I have had homeless people come up to me, tell me their problems. And I don't know if, it's, if they see God in me or if they're just looking for anyone to talk to because no one else will. And I've had instances where homeless people share their stories with me. There, I remember this one time I was in a gas station downtown and someone came up to me and he showed me his empty bottle of Listerine. And he was like, hey, can you spare me a couple dollars so that I can continue in the mess that I'm in and get another bottle of Listerine because it's so much cheaper than booze. He was stuck begging, sitting there. He couldn't get up. He had to have other people carry him. But it says that he was begging at the gate called Beautiful. Have you ever had an ugly situation in a beautiful place? This guy had an ugly situation in a beautiful place. And Peter said, let me make this place even more beautiful for you. Get up in Jesus' name. So when we're stuck in these situations, are we going to say, oh, sometimes it'd be that way, have a woe is me attitude? Or are we going to place ourselves in God's hands and allow him to free us from these situations? As Jeffy said in the call to worship this morning, today you might have one thing, tomorrow could be something completely different, but at the same time, God is on the throne. He's still in charge. Sometimes we put our trust in God and still feel stuck. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Misty Edwards has a song called The Waiting Room. And you can look it up and listen to it on YouTube. Um, as you're walking out this morning, I'll play a little bit of it for you. It's... Twelve and a half minutes long, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. Uh, but the entire song is talking about how she's stuck in the place of unanswered prayer. She's like, God, I keep praying about this situation. It has gotten to the point now where I've been praying about this for ten years, and it still hasn't happened 
It's a hopeless situation. Why aren't you removing me from it? I know that you can. Sometimes God answers our prayer, prayers by saying, wait. And going back to Ecclesiastes, there may be a time for everything, but here in Ecclesiastes 3.11 it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. We took communion today. And we read the story the first Sunday of every month that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread, handed it to his disciples, and then they took the cup and drank from that as well. Jesus gave us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper on the same night that he was betrayed. He suffered through a wrongful trial, conviction, and death on a cross. So how did he respond to these tough times? He responded by still washing the feet of the person who would later betray him that same night. He laid down his life for all mankind. No one took it from him. He willingly laid it down. And he rose from the dead three days later. So a time that seemed so bleak became a time of such beauty. Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your presence. I pray for everyone here today, Lord, whatever they may be going through in life, Lord, I just ask that you would reveal more of yourself to them and that they would grow closer to you. I ask that I would grow closer to you, Father. I ask, Lord, that we wouldn't contribute to any ruts that we may have or anyone else has, but that we would edify each other and build each other up in the faith. Father, sometimes there's so much uncertainty. We know the end of the story. We know that you are still on the throne and that you have already won. I ask that you would take our lives, make them your own, live out your life through all of us, through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may, his cause, may he cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace, lifting up the light of his countenance. May God bless you, you are dismissed.